Well, we are very happy, very pleased to uh, have you uh, here for our uh, webinar about the tax uh, from the tax uh, working group. MRP is uh, trying also like to emerge from this uh, COVID situation and in many places we don't even uh, use the, the, the name anymore of COVID. Hopefully uh, no, uh, no new uh, variants coming up. So we hopefully uh, stay tight and hopefully we may have our first uh, in-person meeting this year. We, 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 we really uh, hope that this will be possible. We have a great subject today, which is about cryptocurrency. Uh, Darren has been uh, in the forefront of this subject, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, people from the older generation, like, uh, like me, for example, we, we have to learn a lot about that. And we, um, I'm sure um, this uh, webinar will be very interesting uh, for me as well. Uh, um, it's very interesting if you go back to the advantage of those cryptocurrencies who include the cheaper and faster money transfers and decentralized systems that also do not collapse at a single point of failure. That is a very strong point of, uh, of cryptocurrency. The disadvantages, and we will probably uh, discuss this in this forum, include the price volatility, the high energy consum um, consumption for uh, mining activities, and also the use in uh, criminal activities. Of course, we, we accountants and tax people, we, we don't know criminal activities generally, so... Uh, <laughs> I uh, maybe have to do a couple of words. Maybe, um, Thomas, you can uh, say a few words also from your side as an introduction. Thank you, Bodoan. Um, first of all, how, thank you for arranging this very great subject, topical and uh, most up to date. Uh, Darren, while well, you have been uh, working very hard to organize PEFs conferences. Um, on the dinner, even though we have not been able to see each other for almost two years or more than that. And I look forward to seeing every one of you in person, hopefully by uh, the fourth quarter of this year. And uh, this, is, this subject today is more on taxation. And uh, after that, we shall learn a lot more, especially in different countries, how um, crypto gains will be, will be taxed and losses will be allowed. And, and another issue which we have to face for those crypto um, traders or those companies which um, generate um, those coins is the licensing because regulation of crypto and NFT uh, is becoming a great subject. So it is something that I look forward to uh, be able to participate in a conference because it is it is a subject which we cannot avoid if we have to advise on um, any startup or any compliance issue for those uh, crypto traders and those um, who which coin mint crypto coins. Um, I pass over to Darren, who organized this seminar, and I look forward to learn a lot from you guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Or oh, depending on what part of the world you are, good evening. Uh, thank you for sharing some of your time today. I know that everyone is super busy at this time of the year, because for many of us, it is part of tax season. Right. Okay. But of course, I... I, I I don't want this to be uh, like a monologue where someone is standing up on high, bestowing knowledge in everyone. I think what I what I see it more as information sharing. I I certainly would not call myself a student, uh, 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 an expert on crypto. I consider myself a student of crypto. So there's so much I'm still learning, and I am humbled uh, to to be. Uh, coached by people with the the intellect and the experience of of Mukesh and 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 others here in in, in this room. 
So please let's let's keep it informal and let's keep it conversational. Uh, so I've muted everyone because some of you have had background noise, but at any point in time you could unmute and you can you can jump in, right? This is being recorded as you probably heard the sound as, as you logged in. So which means that if you have colleagues that couldn't make it or you want to review it or you want to share it, then you're free to do so. Once it's recorded, I'll just upload it somewhere and I'll, I'll drop the link in the WhatsApp group and, and you can do with it as you, as you will. Nothing is super confidential. These are just general conversations, nothing too confidential, okay? So I will now share my screen. All right, so this is a, a rough outline of, of what we're gonna cover, of what we're gonna explore within the, the next hour or so. So uh, Bunip is going to jump in after me, Mitesh, Dicky, and Mikael. Mikael is based in London, so he uh, it's kind of late for him. So he he recorded uh, just a video clip, so I'll play that. And then we'll hopefully have like a Q&A or more of a conversation at the end of it. All right. So, I mean, what brings us here is really the scale of the opportunity, like, like many of us, uh, our, some of our bigger clients or some of, more, of our more lucrative clients have been in the crypto space. So, you know, I've been dealing with guys who obviously are crypto investors, but also guys who are doing mining, uh, crypto traders, and the distinction between the investors and traders, we will explore a little bit later. Uh, crypto casinos, gambling, uh, and it is surprisingly lucrative. I have, I had no clue that this space existed and how lucrative it is. And uh, recently, within the last, say, six or seven months, I've actually started accepting payments in crypto as well, using Coinbase or one of the more pop, which is one of the more popular exchanges in the US. So it's a huge opportunity. That's why we're here. I'm going to have to assume that people have at least a basic understanding of, of what it is. Otherwise, that we could segue into a whole hour-long conversation as to what the basic principles are. From my very simplistic, naive perspective, it, uh, it's an asset. But what makes this different is that we're all familiar as accountants, we're all familiar with ledgers. But in our experience or within our world and our ecosystem, ledgers have been centralized. So whether you use you know, we use well, Zero or Quicken or Intuit, MYOB or whatever software you've been using. It's in a central server somewhere, or maybe it's local on your laptop or your desktop. And that's the unique record of what the transactions for that particular entity would have been. So I guess what makes this one different, what makes the whole crypto, crypto ecosystem different is the decentralized nature of that ledger the fact that everyone who participates keeps a copy of that ledger uh i think it, there was some conversation around i went to a, a crypto discussion in london some years ago and someone said the, the first time that they heard about it was after 9 11 because there was a certain financial institution i don't need to get into who it was that was their server was in one of the towers that, that collapsed and it was not backed up anywhere else. And they were important to a big transaction between a Japanese bank and a US bank. They were an intermediary. And because their data basically disappeared, there was great difficulty in reconstructing the transaction after the fact. So that's, you know, for that person who's sharing that example said that's when they first heard that they saw a use case for a decentralized ledger so that if any one participant is removed, everyone else has a copy of all the transactions. And, and, that's, and that's what makes this, this, this unique and what makes this space interesting. And I guess it falls in the context of Web 3.0. So Web 2.0, which is where we are emerging from, we saw the existence of big players. So, uh, you know, whether, well, in the West, it would be Google or, or Meta, which is what we call Facebook or Amazon. 
now we we emerging into a world where it will be more decentralized and so rather than big behemoths we will see important players in different niches and I think in that spirit is where crypto fits in, the idea of everything being decentralized and transparent and participatory as well. One of the, so we, I mean, I think crypto was really hot in terms of uh, a profit making opportunity. There was a lot of speculation and a lot of speculative gains up until let's say the middle of last year. So summer 2021. But since then, there's been more action or there's been more media attention paid to NFTs. I think from my perspective, one of the distinctions between, I guess, the, the basic coins and the NFTs uh, are the coins, whether it be Bitcoin or Litecoin or, or whatever, they are fungible. So it's kind of like the money that you have in your wallet. So if you have a dollar and nobody's tracking that one particular dollar, so the the point is that you have a balance and you and you keep track of the balance of the currency that you hold what makes nfts different is that it's the same principle it sits on a blockchain everyone has a copy of who has what and who has transacted with whom but it's non-fungible so that each asset has a unique identifier and there's a there's attention paid not just to the pool, but to that unique asset. And of course, like crypto, to be fair, probably 99% of it has been useless uh, scams or, or whatever, but there have been, it reminds me of the dot-com situation in the late 90s. There was a, a huge bubble, it popped, and out of that, they theme substantive players that we understand today and i think that's what's happening both in the crypto and the nft space there was a huge explosion there was a lot of excitement but what has been left standing are some important players that we need to keep an eye on so okay uh so i guess the, the important thing is to understand the the way transactions are recorded and the way transactions are mapped Every, every node or every participant in the blockchain, they have a unique identifier, a public, uh, a public address or a public wallet, a, a public key. And it, it seems strange that someone would have their, their, their balance, like their, their wealth publicly available, but that, that's the, that seems to be the nature of it. And there are investigators on YouTube who track scammers. And it's, it seems relatively easy to do because you can see where coins and where you can see where the virtual assets move from one point to another. You can see who's trading with whom and you can see the balance in various wallets. So you may not be able to tie that back to an individual, but you, you can see the, the public address of, uh, of a particular wallet. <sighs> the idea of a wallet is something that's interesting from a tax perspective because there's debate going on in, okay, in the U.S., it really doesn't matter, right? Because if, you, if it is you in the U.S., you're taxing your worldwide income and you can't, uh, you can't break that without giving up your citizenship or you're giving up your residency, but in jurisdictions where you can, which is the rest of the world, and particularly in the UK, we're seeing a lot of conversation about, okay, where is your wallet? And if it is that you, you, you the people in the UK, you have the election of being taxed uh, on your worldwide income. So you, you're taxed domiciled in the UK. And there, there are people who have the election to be non-domiciled. They're, ta they're, uh, they're a resident in the UK, but they're not tax domiciled in, in the UK. So they're res non-dom. So they're resident, but they're non-domiciled in the UK, which means that the income that arises outside of the UK is not taxed. Only stuff that arises inside. So there's a conversation about, okay, how can they structure their holdings or the location of their wallet or the access to their wallets so that it won't be taxable in the UK? if they have that that status so you know that that could be an interesting point of uh, of exploration for, for jurisdictions that have that 
territorial tax regime. So like Hong Kong or Malaysia or Singapore. It, it, it's, uh, I'm sure these things aren't uh, determined yet, but I, I would expect to see uh, court cases and in time regulation that and and uh, and perhaps guidance from the relevant tax offices as to how permissible is it to legally avoid tax simply by the way in which you structure your holding of of your crypto assets. So yeah, that that this is a another area of of developing conversation as well. To what extent is crypto a unit of exchange versus a store of value? A unit of exchange, so for example, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is kind of useless when it comes to actually making purchase purchases and 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 big and transactions because it's kind of clumsy and it takes a long time for a transaction to be concluded. Long time compared to other coins, or even if you're transacting with in the traditional world, a credit or debit card. So then you, the, there are other coins that are better suited to for actual transactions. Whereas many people see Bitcoin being the premier coin, more of a, a store value in the way in which we see precious metals. So <clears throat> anyway, that's just part of the conversation. But essentially, I think there is consensus at least at this point in time that crypto is an asset there are very few jurisdictions that see it as an actual currency but that's right now I, one would expect that with the passage of time more and more jurisdictions will begin to see at least some of them as currencies and especially since certain governments themselves are getting on board with their own where governments are issuing digital currencies as in the cbdc central bank digital currencies but for the most part, in most most of the jurisdictions, at, at least to, in which we, the, we have had some sort of experiences, that is considered an asset. So, when so and for most part, for the most part, most of the taxpayers that we would have had uh, that we have dealt with so far have been classified as investors. So therefore. The, the question we and the conversations we have around with, around that would be, okay, when is it considered to be a taxable transaction? It varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction naturally, but for the most part, crypto to fiat. So fiat being regular traditional currency like US dollars or euros or Singapore dollars or whatever that 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 is definitely i think that's consensus that's considered to be a taxable transaction but in depending on the jurisdiction actually crypto to crypto is considered also a taxable transaction i don't think it's a taxable transaction in uk but it is a taxable transaction in the us for example and of course spending crypto again that's a disposal of an asset so that'll be a taxable transaction Giving crypto as a gift, again, it depends on the jurisdiction. It's not necessarily taxable in the US, but it would be taxable in the UK and, and Australia uh, under certain conditions. So the, the, the gain naturally is the delta, the difference between what the value is at disposal versus the, the cost basis, so what you purchased it for. And in terms of that cost basis now, there are, depending on what exchange or the platform or whatever it is that you use to acquire the token, there would be additional fees uh, associated with, 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 with purchasing it and holding it. So that would add to the basis as well. In terms of income, and I think probably we'll get into this in a bit more detail later on if there's an appetite for it, because some of it can get pretty technical. When is it taxed as income? There, you know, for example, us when we when our clients decide to settle their invoices in coins in, in crypto, you know, in income. So when it's in exchange for a good or service, there's also mining, which I think we'll get into in a little bit more detail. So the the way in which, depending on the on the coin, the way in which the number of coins in circulation is 
policed or managed. There's, uh, and I'm sure you, you'd be familiar with it because there's been a lot of discussion in the media. There are complex calculations and which would require a lot of machines, which is Baudouin's point about energy usage and, and whatever. But basically by solving these complex calculations, individuals or participants are rewarding, rewarded by being issued coins in exchange for the, the services that they rendered and that'll be income. Airdrops, sometimes uh, additional coins are, are issued and it could be considered like a bonus or income. Staking, because of its decentralized nature, participants are uh, invited uh, there's there's no requirements there's no nobody is being forced but people volunteer in order to help validate transactions and that that process of validation is is referred to as a staking in many jurisdictions and again all, all you know these these types of things are, are treated as income now what i'll do is i will pause there and i'll hand over to bunyep who will jump in and talk about badges of trade. Uh, thank you, Darren. Uh, mm -hmm. And good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to have everyone uh, today and uh, uh, some familiar faces. Uh, are we like what uh, Thomas Lee was saying? Uh, we hope to meet each other again uh, soon enough. Okay, so without further ado, let's uh, discuss a little bit more uh, on the topics of badges of trades. So often being asked is, um, what is actually crypto? So what happened to the capital appreciation? How do you deal with it? So often people will ask, uh, is it the capital gain or profits? So it very much depends, okay, um, on how you deal with it. Uh, and in Singapore, we look at uh, badges of trade. So let us quickly just go through a uh, few of the aspects that is important um, to determine whether uh, crypto is actually a gain or profits. So uh, firstly, you talk about uh, length of ownership, right? So one of the badges of trade, so is length of ownership, right? So it's often that if you hold for a longer time, uh, it's more towards a, a capital uh, intention, right? So you're holding it, okay, for capital gain. Right, so length of ownership is important. So it takes, uh, if you, you do it in a very quick manner, you buy and sell, right, uh, in a short manner, then in this case, it's very much a, um, more towards a, of a trade, just like a, a investment in a shares. It can be also trade, it can be investments for a long term capital gain, all right. So, <clears throat> yeah, the next point is about frequency of the transactions. So this thing is very much aligned with uh, the nature of the trade. So if you look at uh, a typical trading company, right? So you have a high frequency, buy and sell, buy and sell in a very high frequency, right? So aligning with uh, uh, capital in nature, you would probably hold it for a longer time. So you would uh, obviously see a, a lesser frequency happening, right? So uh, the third point is uh, supplementary work. So if you look at uh, supplementary work, it's actually uh, what have you done on uh, to make it more, uh, let's say if you're doing something, some supplementary work to make it more marketable, right? Obviously it's more of a trading in nature. Likewise, if you keep it, uh, um, I mean, a, a minimum uh, um, work that be done. Say for instance, if you buy a property with minimum work to get it, uh, uh, up and running. So uh, your intention is more towards renting out, right? And for future capital appreciation, yeah, that carry weights, right? Uh, to justify that is a capital in nature, right? So, um, okay, often you also look at uh, your motive, right? Uh, the motive of holding these assets. So for crypto, what is your intention of holding? It's very important, your business plan, right? So your intention is to hold it for long-term capital uh, gain. Uh, yes, is obviously uh, these are investments. So it's aligned with uh, the length of ownership actually, right? So your profit, if you have a profit motive with the intention to buy and sell uh, during in a very short uh, period of time, obviously that is profit in nature, right? 
Then other points you look at is uh, like the mode of purchase. So often enough, if you own something capital in nature, uh, you would finance it over a longer period than a shorter term, right? So in trading, obviously, there's a shorter period of uh, financing. So that would also carry weights when you look at uh, whether the transaction to be dealt with uh, in the capital or in the uh, trading uh, uh, aspect, right? So um, the subject matter, okay, the nature is also important. So for instance, if uh, you own uh, the, the crypto, um, specifically, um, let's say if, if you are holding out this, uh, uh, a lot of coins, right? Uh, uh, a lot of types of coins uh, for a purpose of capital appreciation. Right, so you will see a pattern of uh, a lot more uh, coins being owned than rather a few types. So if you look at uh, you're concentrating towards a few types of uh, um, coins, cryptographic uh, assets, then in this case you are you have more transaction happening, right, uh, between these few coins than very much uh, towards a trading nature, right, and uh, I mean uh, when you sell. Okay, obviously you, you have to look at uh, uh, factors like your circumstances of selling it, right? Is it a, a, a point where you, you for, it's a way to force to sell or if you need some financing, you, you're forced to sell it. Then in this case, uh, you don't have intention to sell, but uh, because of certain financing purpose, you have to sell it. Then uh, compare with, if you think that the market is good, right? Uh, you have to sell it because there's an intention of uh, profit taking. Yeah, that also decides between a, a trade and a capital, right? Um, lastly, I would say other factors that are important that you have to look at. Um, what is your intention of holding, right? So probably this would be supported by board minutes. So when you invest in crypto, you probably, if you do, do it via a company, you will have board minutes, right? So to support that, all these are important things that you should ready. So for crypto traders, uh, it's very important to keep proper documentations because all these documentations are um, potentially, okay, will be asked by uh, the Inland Revenue to support, right, your intention to hold it, whether is it for profit taking or for capital appreciation, right? In Singapore, uh, it's quite clear. So there is no... Um, capital gains tax. So if you are classified, if your cryptos are classified as a capital gain, uh, you need not uh, need to pay tax. Likewise, if it's trading, obviously you are subject to tax, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So over the years, there have been a lot of uh, changes in the crypto space. Uh, regulations have been uh, implemented. So do in Singapore, uh, there are a few rounds of uh, uh, regulations. So. Um, we dealt with also uh, companies in uh, uh, crypto space, uh, crypto exchange, even crypto trading. So it's very challenging uh, because uh, it's so dynamic, right? And uh, the involvement of crypto space is uh, much more faster than uh, the regulators. So often there are uh, difficult areas requires high judgment, right? To consider uh, between trading and capital, right? So, um, yes, I, I would think that uh, if traders would like to consider in uh, crypto, having crypto, is it a trade or for uh, to go through a series of uh, initial due diligence, right? There are things that you have to uh, get yourself ready, right? In I mean, you don't want surprise, you don't want to be caught like uh, your intention is for investment, but ended up you, you have to be taxed by the, uh, the tax man, right? All right. So yes, in a nutshell, uh, I mean, that is a uh, badges of trade. So uh, over to you, uh, Darren. Thank, thanks for that overview. So just to create context for those who may not be from a, a common law jurisdiction, this is huge. This is, I can't overstate how big a deal this is. So if it is you in the UK or the US, uh, depending on how you structure your affairs, the capital gains rate could be at a substantial discount to like ordinary profit or ordinary income. 
So therefore, you're highly incentivized, depending on what you're trying to do, to get this thing classified as capital gains. So you want to be seen as an investor in, in many cases. But in, I guess, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, this is a zero-sum game. These people are going to live or die by this classification because Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore capital gains are normally tax-free. So, you know, I've had calls and conversations with investors in, in Singapore who just want to be super clear as because the implications, this is the, the implications are in the millions of dollars. Now, unfortunately, in terms of the legislation, the legislation tends to be a bit gray in terms of the distinction between that investor and a trader. So what we do is we look at case law and there's a rich body of case law that originates from the UK as to the, that distinction between the investor and the trader. So whether it's trading profit or capital gains. So, you know, that this is the huge court cases being brought right now across the common law world where people are fighting for things to be classified as capital gains because that that's this is this is the front line in terms of crypto tax controversy at least in the common law world so with with that uh, i'll pass over to to mitesh who will talk more about trading mitesh hello <clears throat> good morning everyone uh, from india uh, it has been uh, always a uh, look forward for this kind of programs uh, by MRAP. Uh, and I will also look forward for a physical meeting very soon with every one of you in the next uh, few months to come. Uh, I will just put up a quick presentation on the topic. I think uh, we have been uh, doing some work on in this area together with Darren and others. Uh, yeah, and uh, there are uh, there are things that have come across when uh, we were taking decisions about uh, which kind of uh, <clears throat> activity is considered as a, as a, uh, are you able to see the screen? Yeah. So which kind of activities uh, uh, this uh, this trader or investor doing and why, how to treat uh, these transactions and how to do real accounting of these transactions because uh, there are two, three levels of uh, challenges when we look at the transactions. So when we look at the transactions in the hierarchy of uh, detail, we always look at uh, whether uh, a particular type of currency that the client is dealing is a store of wealth like uh, for example he's dealing in uh, gold silver artwork nft specifically uh, nowadays metaverse is another area where people are uh, debating and discussing whether it is a store of wealth etc uh, and also there are transactions with regards to something called as uh, uh, what you call uh, the usdt or the tether or you can call as uh, the transactions where uh, uh, there is a uh, packed coins, uh, which uh, which actually are packed with the US dollar or with the Euro. So they are like more like a store of wealth. Then there are other uh, currencies which are more like a store of value, uh, like equity or bonds or something like that, which are received in the ICO. And the third are uh, the medium of exchange, uh, which are like Bitcoin or others, which are just used for the medium of exchange. So all these three have to be first studied and understood as to which kind of transaction one is getting into. And accordingly, one has to decide the accounting treatment or the IFRS or the IAS, which is suitable for these kind of transactions. Uh, the other angle is whether the client is a minor he is uh, doing an ICO, that is initial coin offering, or he is an investor or a trader, or he is an artist, coder, businessman uh, who is accepting uh, his compensation in the form of crypto. So all these four type of uh, activities are, look, are to be looked at before deciding uh, which kind of treatment or how the accounting of this kind of uh, transactions are required to be done. 
so uh, as we understand it is very very important that we decide correct way of doing the accounting on the basis of these two parameters one is uh, which kind of currencies or assets this guy is dealing and the other is uh, what uh, what business this person is into he is into which type of activity so if he is into the uh, uh, you know he is dealing in store of value then we may consider him uh, as uh, more as a business person when he deals in store of wealth generally we consider him as investor and when he is just transacting in the medium of exchange currency then we generally consider him as a trader or a speculator for that matter and when he is a miner we consider him as a business when he is a ico we consider him as a business when he is just transacting we bifurcate him between trader and investor and of course when he is artist coder businessman again uh, we treat him as a business so there i think there will be three types of treatments one will be considering someone uh, doing business with crypto uh, the other would be considering someone as speculating with crypto and uh, considering his gains or losses as speculation or losses or gains and the third would be treating him as capital gains or an, uh, like an investor so this is how uh, we look at three types of transactions and accordingly we do accounting um uh, <clears throat> some issues that we have been facing in accounting while doing the cryptocurrency accounting are uh, availability of information in cryptocurrency this is the biggest issue uh, that is been faced while uh, doing accounting for the cryptocurrency customers uh, because the information is always uh, incomplete or not according to the accountant's mindset uh the accountant always has a mindset of having um, running uh, ledgers with cumulative balances which the cryptocurrency exchanges generally don't provide uh, other is whether uh, we want to um, treat uh, this kind of transactions as cash or cash equivalent intangible asset commodity security these are four types of uh, considerations while we look at ifrs or ias so it is very typical that a trader deals in all four types of uh, all three types of currencies that is he deals in uh, store of wealth he deals in um, what you call uh, a medium of exchange and he also deals in the in the uh, store of value kind of transactions so it is very complicated to categorize those transactions and give them different color while we are doing the transactions so it is very difficult uh, for us to find out a thin line between all three or four of different varieties of transactions that a trader or a or a or a business person or an investor gets into third is uh, functional or reporting uh, currency conversion it is very typical in uh, cryptocurrency world that uh, the setup is in some other country and the reporting has to be done in some other country and uh, the currency in which the transactions happen are something else so for example the transactions happen in bitcoin the reporting currency is us dollar and uh, the person is dealing in a functional world or a country where euro is predominantly considered to be a functional currency so these kind of transactions where there are three layer four layer currency conversions required are very typical and Uh, apparent in the cryptocurrency world so it is very important that you look at these three layer four layer conversions in a systematic manner find out data on the basis of which you will do that conversion from one currency to another currency and third currency and so on so it is very very difficult in general parlance we generally deal with two currencies one is like a functional currency and another is like a, a reporting currency in this kind of situation you are dealing in three or four layers uh, in fact there are situations where you don't find a direct conversion between the reporting currency and the uh, the con- currency in which the transactions are happening so you have to use one middle currency to decide whether a reporting currency can be converted into sorry a, a functional currency will be converted into a reporting currency and how to handle valuation in crypto tokens is another point of concern that always comes in our mind because we are accountants we want to do balance sheet 
as far as uh, transactions are concerned so it is very difficult for us to find out how we will do the valuation uh, because in crypto 24 by 7 the uh, tra transactions happen it is not like a nasdaq or a or a B bombay stock exchange or a national stock exchange which has open time and close time and cut off time and uh, you can find out the rates at the cut off time and you can find out rate at the opening time or you can find out an average rate during the day because the transaction happened 24 by 7 uh, time zones of each client is different so uh, a client has 12 o'clock in the night and someone has uh, two o'clock same time someone has eight o'clock same time so it is very difficult to find out a day and rate for in such situation so valuation becomes a bigger challenge and bigger issue while doing the cryptocurrency balance sheet and PNL account, or you can say the income statement and the reporting statement. It is very typical in cryptocurrency world that you take uh, GMT plus zero as the basis and uh, do the transaction valuations on the uh, on a particular balance sheet or PNL. Then uh, another very typical issue is uh, like in the case of securities or stocks. It is very easy to get data from the centralized exchanges. Here, it is very difficult to get data. Another very important thing is the data is not straightened. So a DEFI or a decentralized exchange would, uh, would position the data in a different way. And a CEFI, that is a centralized exchange, would put position a data in a different way. You will find huge uh, discrepancies between the reporting patterns of both these types of uh, currencies and uh, you know exchanges and you will have to take a accountant's judgment for deciding on which parameters you will take a call for doing the valuation so it is becoming very challenging in the world of crypto where you get uh, different information from different parts of the world from different modes of exchanges and different types of exchanges when you actually uh, want to do a valuation and you will have to rely on one of the modes which is most predominant and have to take an accountant's judgment or estimate while uh, deciding the valuation of the crypto. Uh, then um, uh, you have to uh, discuss about how to calculate the gain and loss in the crypto transaction. One of the biggest areas of uh, concern or issue is uh, calculation of gain and loss. So when you look at uh, the traders which are high volume uh, traders, uh, it is generally a barter transaction and not a US dollar transaction or a euro transaction. So uh, in a barter transaction, when you are buying wheat for rice or you are buying uh, grains for um, uh, vegetables, uh, there is no gain or loss, right? So it is very difficult to find out whether a transaction to transaction gain or loss is happening in such scenarios where there is a barter transaction. So in our view, when it is a trader, pure, pure trader, uh, there is no gain or loss that is happening in the barter. Only gain or loss is happening uh, as far as increase or decrease in the valuation of his balance assets on the reporting date is concerned. So closing uh, valuation minus opening valuation is generally the gain or loss in case of the high volume traders. Uh, as far as the uh, capital gains or the persons who are having transactions, less volume transactions, but are uh, acting like investors or businesses. It is a FIFO method, that is first in, first out method that is required to be followed. And in those cases only, each and every transaction is converted in dollar rate, which is very difficult as I discussed in the crypto scenario because of discrepancy in the data in various exchanges uh, and do the calculation on transaction to transaction gain and loss which happens uh, uh, with very, uh, you know, uh, with a, in, a, in a very difficult way when we try to do it. Because there are two, three levels of currencies involved and sometimes the currency conversions are not available easily. And lastly, how to account for fees, charges uh, for transactions or conversions. In crypto, it is very typical that number of transactions and uh, uh, the, uh, the fees as high as 4, 5% to 10%, 15% of the transaction value. There is something called as gas fee and there is something called as transaction fee, which is very, very high. Uh, and uh, the fees typically is not always in the quote currency. It may be in a different currency. 
for example if you are dealing in a binance smart chain or a coinbase then you will find that the coinbase or a binance smart chain would have their fee currency as a different currency so when you actually do the transactions you find out that uh, you are doing transaction of exchanging ethereum to a bitcoin but the fee is been charged in bnb so it is very typical that you have to do a separate calculation for the fees part while you are doing the calculation for the capital gain or the trading loss or profit for the currency part so fee completely is uh, unparalleled uh, to the transactions that are happening in many cases the code currency is the base for the fees but in most cases nowadays the exchanges are following uh, fees in their own way that is in bnb or in uh, for that matter wrx or trx on the basis of uh, transactions or the uh, uh, you know model that they are following and they give huge discounts if you pay fees in bnb so it is very difficult for as accountants for us to look at one transaction in three models one is base currency code currency and then the fee currency so, so it is very very uh, different while we do accounting of securities is mm -hmm. the accounting for the cryptocurrency um, um, lastly uh, uh, availability of information in cryptocurrency that is multiple wallets and exchanges used for doing transaction the due to the flexibility of the crypto the investor tends to use four or five different wallets he uses two three exchanges while for doing the transaction he uses two three jurisdictions while doing the transaction and that makes it very very complex for us to as accountants to decide how to uh, you know view those transactions and create the uh, profit and loss or the income statements in those scenarios another thing is valid balances on date of reporting is very difficult to get so there is no cross confirmation from the exchange uh, like in in the case of banks typically we ask for cross confirmation as auditors or assurance provider and we rely on those uh, uh, those balances and uh, we use them as control totals or controls for deciding whether we are doing right accounting or not but in these kind of scenarios it is very difficult to get the wallet confirmations from the decentralized wallets like metamask like trust wallet uh, like bsc that is binance smart chain wallets uh, like Con coinbase wallets they don't provide us confirmations so this is very difficult because they are also settling down they don't know the accounting nuances in fact uh, the entire finance world is been now driven by the technology people so they look at the transactions in a completely different way as against the accountants look at and that is actually complicating the situation when i was doing one of the accounting manuals i looked at the ifrs uh, .org which is the website on which uh, they decide or discuss about various transactions typicalities and accounting models for the same uh, the ifrs has written a huge research paper on this topic and uh, they are also not conclusive about what is the model or mechanism to be used in this situation and they actually agree that uh, these are financial transactions carried out by non financial or technology people and that is making it typically different than what we look at in other cases then third is data about transaction fees charged or gas fees this is very very typical many times the data is completely unavailable they just give you a rate saying that for usd so much you can exchange so many bitcoins but in the process they charge you a fee etc which is not been shown in any of the transactions so the, there are a lot of hidden fees which are not clearly shown while doing the transaction to the investor so investor enters into the transaction and then we when you download the statement you find out there is a fee there is a charge which is hidden and the transaction looks like there is no fee but this is this is something that happens uh, then data about actual currency in which the transactions are carried out uh it is very difficult because when you are doing transaction with uh, usd to bn uh, binance uh, sorry the bitcoin that time there is some uh, middle coin that is involved for example usdt so usd first gets converted into usdt and then it gets converted into bitcoin but you don't get that trail while doing the transaction but while you are actually accounting you need that trail to do the proper accounting so that uh, middle currency data is missing 
in most of the cases then you have to drill down and find out that information and most of the exchanges are unresponsive they don't give you any information on email or anything so you have to uh, you know struggle to get uh, right information from the exchanges lastly data about conversion rates in reporting currency on a particular date is a discussion that we already did that it is very typical and it is difficult to get that information uh, as far as ifrs is concerned uh, you can go on the ifrs website and look at all these papers uh, which are being debated and discussed uh, all throughout the journey of ifrs getting evolved and the uh, reporting standards getting evolved for cryptocurrency and uh, you can look at few accounting standards to simulate the transactions that are happening in cryptocurrency world with the real world transactions like ias2 for inventories ifrs9 for financial instruments ias8 for accounting policies and change in accounting estimates and errors which talks about if there is no typical information available use this ias32 ias21 and ias38 so these are few indicative standards that you can look at while you are taking calls about your clients on how to do accounting and reporting for them uh, lastly uh, as i discussed about the barter model uh, crypto assets uh, gains and losses are very very difficult in case of traders and when they follow the barter model and then it becomes very challenging for you to look at them as inventory or cash or cash equivalent and financial instruments or intangible assets so uh, with this i would like to conclude the the presentation thank you darren for giving me the opportunity and uh, we can uh, discuss this further thank you pretty comprehensive okay so i know it may have been a bit overwhelming for, for some of us so allow me to kind of give my uh simple minded as a simple minded person my summary of the takeaways so we're accounting firms. What are the three takeaways? What are the three most important things that you want to walk away from, walk away with this morning? The first thing is, I think, the, given the the way the the ecosystem is structured, there's clearly a, a tax planning opportunity you, uh, by leveraging jurisdictions that have lower or no capital gains taxes i.e. your Hong Kong, your Malaysia's, and your Singapore's. And it's not so different from the other corporate structures we have. We know that our wealthy clients, uh, they, they appreciate now that there's economic substance. You need to set up proper family offices. You need to structure your affairs in a way that makes sense to tax uh, offices in all jurisdictions. So just like they set up their own treasury or their wealth management functions in certain key jurisdictions, same thing with their crypto same thing with the nfts we can do we can help them do the same thing we've helped clients uh move or reposition to estonia portugal dubai recently with mitesh cayman islands the clients need this kind of help together with the tax lawyers the tax lawyers have these big ideas and we get to do the heavy lifting and we charge accordingly so that's the first one structuring where these assets are actually held uh, the second thing would be the whole discussion around capital gains, like what Bunyip was talking about, capital gains versus trading profit. That, again, huge planning opportunity. And, you know, the landscape is still uncertain. So the tax offices are still, uh, they're still open to negotiation. They're still open to taking certain positions because it's a bit gray right now. But huge planning opportunity and huge client billing opportunity. So that's number two. And thirdly, we get to Mitesh. I know there are a lot of guys selling software that would help uh, your, your clients deal with crypto accounting. If your client is sufficiently sophisticated, the software that's on sale is all useless. It's absolutely useless. They must come to an accounting firm. They must. They must, they must, they must. And for me, uh, with Mitesh at my side, we've been able to win some pretty big clients because they've tried the accounting, they've, they've tried the crypto software that's being aggressively advertised, and it is not fit for purpose for the sophisticated trader and the sophisticated investor. 
they're trading across multiple blockchains, multiple exchanges, multiple jurisdictions, and there's no software built for that. They need to come to an accounting firm. But as you can tell from what Mitya has just explained, it's not a traditional accounting firm. I've, I've logged into some of the meetings with Mitesh and his team, and they're talking about programming languages. It's big data. Uh, they're talking about, I, I've heard SQL programming, or maybe I heard somebody mention Python. So they're doing big data manipulation, especially for our clients that are high frequency traders. They deal with millions of transactions. It's just like a commodity trader. So it is, it is not for an accounting firm that is not backed up by that kind of tech expertise but if you do have it you are rare you're one of the few that can offer that service and you can charge a premium for it so again the three takeaways uh multi-jurisdictional tax planning the whole badges of trade piece from bunyip capital gains versus trading profit and the heavy lifting the the huge data accounting piece that's me, Tesh. Those are your takeaways. Those are your quick wins. That's how you're bringing value to your firms. Any questions? I have one. So we did a live stream a few days ago, I think, or was it last week, uh, for some remote workers, digital nomads in, in Indonesia and Bali, and many of whom are into crypto. And Dicky was sharing some of the latest developments from an Indonesia perspective. Dicky, do you know? share some of what's been happening in Indonesia. Okay. Thank you, Darren. Good morning, folks, everyone. Hoping to meeting you in person very soon. So I'm going to share. I'm going to be fast, no more than five minutes. Okay, a couple of weeks ago, the Minister of Finance has published taxes on crypto asset in Indonesia. Okay. The crypto characteristics certainly is not a money. Okay? It's not currency. So they, they will treat it as a commodity, digital asset or commodity. Under the Commodity Futures Trading Regulatory Agency or SOFTRA. Okay. So crypto based on uh, fiat law is a digital presentation and they will consider it as an intangible taxable goods. Okay, it's not clear now. So they decided that crypto is intangible. If intangible, then it's going to get VAT. Tax on trade transactions. Okay, this is the important one. Taxes on crypto asset trading transaction are revived by electronic system trading operators or ISTO, which include exchangers and e-wallets. Yeah. Tax is collected by ISTO as long as the seller and or the buyer in the custom zone. It means in Indonesian zone, Indonesian area. Okay. There is the, the tax going charge on VAT. Yeah, the VAT will be 0.11% if the exchanger is registered in Chofra or 0.22% if the exchanger is not registered in Chofra. The value of the crypto asset as a transaction. Okay, so, so the exchangers have to charge this VAT. Okay, if the exchangers not registered yet in Indonesia, then no need to charge this. But sooner or later, the Indonesian tax office will deem the, the overseas exchangers to be a fiatable collectors. Okay, on the income tax side, this is only charged uh, for the selling. Yeah, so if you're selling scripts to asset, you will be withhold 0.1% yeah, if the exchanger is registered in Chofra or 0.2% if the exchanger is not registered in Chofra yeah, based on the selling price, okay, based on the selling value. Okay, so this can be an investor options to have their 
uh, wallet, crypto wallet in Indonesia. Yeah, it's defined clearly how much the, the tax rate will be. I think that's all for the, the important one. Oh, maybe I ate another one, sorry. So there is mining service tax, service tax on electronic equipment provision exchanger. And there, so the exchanger has to, to be a capable entrepreneur and pay income tax on the administrative fee. And also there is a transaction verification services on blockchain. So they consider the mining is a services. Yeah. And the, and the miners are fatable entrepreneurs. Yeah. So the VAT will be 1.1%. It's quite low. I think it's very low. Yeah. And the, 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 the income received by the miner also tax with 0.1%. Okay, I think only that, Darren, go back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank All you right, much. so it seems as if we've come to a natural conclusion. Uh, Baudouin, I'll hand it back to you for concluding remarks. Okay, I think this was a great session. Um, very straight to the point. I have made uh, took a few of the slides. I will um, ask Darren if we are allowed to um, to, to to share them. Absolutely. Uh, Christine, thank you, Darren, for your all thank your you. enthusiasm, and uh, we will have very soon um, uh, uh, an accounting and outsourcing uh, a working group uh, uh, meeting, and then we will also have one for audit in June. So. Um, Thank you very much for your enthusiasm and uh, talk to you soon and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.